Okay, welcome back everyone. This is our second lecture on BC 213, the end times. We are um, journeying through the book of Revelation. We've uh, just gone through an overview, a high level, of the first five chapters. And um, let's see if there are any questions. I see a question from John. And John says, as Revelation 4 talks about things going to happen, um, does it mean that there are no elders now casting their crowns and worshipping? Um, just thinking with the songs about the throne room songs, should we be singing these songs as it is going to happen or already happening? Now, we know from this script, these scriptures, chapter 4 and 5, that um, the Lord is telling John these are things that are going to come. Uh, going to happen. But at the same time, we know that, you know, uh, at the time when God was speaking to John, these elders were already there. Many of them had already died and uh, martyred, and they were already there, the apostles, example, the two apostles. Uh, only John was the last apostle. The others had already died and gone to heaven. Old Testament, the prophets, they were all, they were already in heaven. And yet the Lord is telling John, John, it is going to happen, right? He is pointing to the future. Now, what we can say is uh, surely um, right now um, the all the saints who are in heaven, surely they are engaging in worship of God, right? Um, uh, uh, it could be similar to what we are seeing in chapters 4 and 5, in the sense they could be standing around the throne and worshipping, or um, how they are worshipping, you know, how it's taking place. It, there are probably different things happening. But I'm sure that, you know, the saints of God are worshipping the Father. They're worshipping God. And, uh, they're, you know, they're on their harps, and they're, there's prayers coming up. So, to answer your question, there's nothing wrong in singing songs that are based on Revelation 4 and 5 for two reasons. One is, we know there is worship going on in heaven, the angelic beings and uh, um, the saints will be engaged in worship. That's the right thing to do. And we see, you know, even in the Old Testament, uh, as Isaiah has a vision of the Lord, he sees the glory of God and angels saying, holy, holy. So there is worship going on. And also we can sing songs based on Revelation 4 and 5 as a declaration or an, our agreement, our affirmation of what God said is going to happen. All the saints and angels, they bow before the throne. We're just declaring that this is, you know, this is what the Lord said is going to happen. So, that I, so to answer your question, there's nothing wrong in singing throne room songs for these two reasons. One, there is worship happening in the throne room of God. It may not necessarily be exactly like this, but definitely God is being worshipped, and He is holy, holy, holy. So that's one thing. And second is, um, when we sing throne room songs, we are just coming into agreement um, with Revelation 4 and 5, saying this is what is going to happen. We are declaring the same thing. So from that perspective, I think it's fine. Both those perspectives. Sure, but yeah, thank you. thank you. Any other questions on what we've covered so far? Every everybody's following. Okay. So, Revelation four and five is a scene of the throne room. What's happening in heaven? with all the redeemed saints, everybody, along with the angelic beings, worshipping God. And at that time, Jesus comes, the Lamb of God comes. He takes the scroll and he opens it. Meaning, all the prophecies are now going to start happening. And so when we come into chapter 6, verse 1, 
He says, I saw the Lamb, and He opened one of the seals. And then He says, come and see. So that opening of the seal, the opening of the scroll, and opening the seal is symbolic. It's saying, hey, these prophecies which were spoken, which were sealed, or you know, you could say it in our modern language, we say it was kept in cold storage. It was, you know, kept like that. Now the time has come for those things to start happening. And the Lord is saying, John, come and see what's going to happen. Right? So uh, come and see these things that are going to unfold. So as in Revelation 6, as he opens, uh, the, there are these, uh, like we said, there are seven seals that are opened. You know, and every seal is saying that something, some event is, is taking place. But I'm going to just focus on the very first one. When he opens the first seal, Revelation 6 verse 2, I saw a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, um, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. So this white horse, someone on the white horse, and he's got this you know, bow and arrow, meaning he's, he's having uh, the ability to conquer, and he goes about conquering. So the question is, who is this man on the white horse? Now, as you we know, the Lord Jesus also comes riding on a white horse in Revelation 19. But this is a different one. This is the beginning of the tribulation. So this rider on the white horse, Revelation 6, 2, is not Jesus Christ. It's the Antichrist. It's talking about the Antichrist, who's been given a time to operate on the earth. So Revelation 6, 2, is talking about the Antichrist, who, he comes on a white horse, but he's not the Christ. He's a false. He's, he's not the Christ. The real Christ comes riding on a white horse in Revelation 19. This is the Antichrist, and he's going, he's been given authority, crown on his head, and he goes out to conquer. He's taking control. So, the beginning of the events on the earth start off with. The Antichrist being revealed. Now you tie this to what we read in Second Thessalonians chapter two. This man of sin is being restrained. When he who is restrained is taken out of the way, then he will be made manifest. The first thing that you see on earth, Revelation six two, is this Antichrist coming. Where is the church? Taken out of the way. Right? In heaven, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. So it's a it's a very clear indication again, like we said, one of the reasons we gave as to why the church is taken out of the way is because we see this Revelation 4 and 5, and then Revelation 6, 2. The first seal is here comes this man who's riding on a white horse, the Antichrist. He's, he has authority and he's conquering and continues to conquer. And then as you read the rest of Revelation 6, you find uh, different things beginning to happen. And, uh, you know, the second seal, and that's opened. There is uh, 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 war on earth, violence. So immediately there is war on earth. So definitely Revelation 6, 2 cannot represent Jesus. But it's the Antichrist. He's coming in, and right after that, there's all the destruction taking place. Now, this horse, remember, horse, again, has to be understood figuratively. It doesn't mean, you know, uh, he'll actually be coming on a horse. It means the horse represents speed and strength. 
So in Revelation, you the first four seals are um, representing. Uh, are, 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 you see different horses: a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, a pale horse. Now, horse does not doesn't mean that these things are literal; they're figurative, representing speed and strength. Meaning, here comes a man who's moving very fast. Uh, he comes as though he's a good man on a white horse. He's got authority and he's conquering and gaining influence. Second, there's a red horse, which is talking about war, people killing each other. Then verse 5, Revelation 6 and verse 5, there's a black horse talking about famine. Then there is a uh, the fourth seal, that is Revelation 6 and verse 7. There's a pale horse talking about death, hunger, and uh, being you know destruction of life uh, and then we see that there are many people who are being martyred for the faith in christ revelation 6 verse 9 he says when he opened the fifth seal i saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of god and the testimony which they held so right from the start of the tribulation people are going to be killed for believing in christ so that's why we are saying that there will be people who will believe in Christ during the tribulation. Obviously, when they see everything happening, they will know that the Bible is true and they will call on the name of the Lord. They will be saved. But it's going to be very difficult to be a believer. They're going to be slain for the word of God and the testimony where they're held. And their, their souls, of course, they will, be, they will go right up into heaven. And then it tells us here, verse 11, Revelation 6, 11, you know, white robe uh, is given to them. And, uh, and uh, the, the, you know, their fellow servants of brethren who will be killed. That means there are even more people who are going to be killed during the tri tribulation. Okay. And then Revelation 6, 12, there is earthquake, catastrophic things happening. The sun and the moon becoming like blood, stars falling from he heaven. So Jesus spoke about it. You know, he said the moon would be darkened. So this happens on on uh, on um, more than one occasion during the tribulation. So catastrophic things are happening. Cosmic events are happening. Um, the earthquake, the sun, the moon become becoming like blood. Uh, stars or meteors falling to the earth and. Uh, and so on, and the people are crying out to the rock, fall on us and hide, uh, and fall on us. They want to die. They want to hide from the one who sits on the throne. They're recognizing that this is the time of God's judgment. Right? So on the earth, all of these things are starting to take place. Right? Revelation 6. At this time, Revelation chapter 7, God has reserved 144,000 Jewish people who will serve him during the tribulation. Now, these 144,000 Jews, they don't have to be living in Israel. They could be anywhere in the world because, you know, Jewish people are there in Israel. Jewish people are all over the world. But it tells us here in Revelation 7, that um, he says, you know, the, uh, the verse 3, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. That means these 144,000 Jews have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now, this doesn't mean like there's a physical mark uh, in the New Testament. We know that the word to be sealed by God is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Believers, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. Right, So we are sealed. So the seal of God uh, is a language in the New Testament to talk about the presence of the Holy Spirit. So here's again one more reason why we say you know, these servants of God, Revelation 7.3. They have the seal. 
they are servants of God. That means they're going to serve God. They're going to do something. They're ministers of God. And they have the seal of the God on their head. They have been marked by God, given the presence of the Holy Spirit on their lives. Put the name of God upon them. And how many of them are there? Verse 4, Revelation 7, 4. There's 144,000 from the different tribes of Israel. Right? So I'm not getting into the details of the tribes, but there's a little comment we'll make next year when we look at the tribes and so on. But there are 144 of them. And what are these people going to do? They are going to be preaching. They're servants of God. They're going to serve God during the tribulation. Now, you know, there are a lot of questions we could ask. Why did why did God choose 144,000 Jews? Uh, why is he doing this? Uh, we don't know. Uh, there, there, there is, there's a reason, of course, that God knows of why he's having these 144,000 Jews marked, sealed by God to be servants of God during the tribulation. There's a reason. God knows. Perhaps that the Jews rejected Jesus. But now he's using them to proclaim Jesus in the worst time ever. Of course, the second part of the tribulation will be even worse. But 144 of them are serving God. So the gospel is being preached. Will the gospel be preached during the tribulation? Yes. And God is going to, many, many people are going to preach the gospel during the tribulation. But we know that these 144,000 Jews have been will be specifically raised by God all over the world to serve the Lord. And as a result of that, we see what happens. Verse 9, Revelation 7, 9, that John sees. He sees a great multitude of people. Revelation 7, 9. Of all nations, tribes, peoples, and languages, they're standing before the throne of God. They are worshipping. And uh, they're falling before the throne of God. They're worshipping God. And uh, in verse 13, then one of the elders answered to me. So now, the elders, one of the elders, are speaking to John. So there's conversation happening. So John is having a vision of the future. And in that vision, he's seeing a conversation in the future. Right? And he sees one of the elders talking to him and says, you know, do you know who these people are? Where do they come from? And he said, I don't know. Well, you would know. Sir, you know, this is Revelation 7, 14. And what he says, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That means, while the tribulation is going on, people are being killed, being martyred. We saw that in chapter 6. And their souls, they're coming up in the presence of God. And they're worshipping God in spirit. They're clothed. Remember, you know, our spirit is, is real, is a real being. And these beings, spiritual beings, are there in the presence of God. And they're worshipping God. And they're before the throne of God. They're serving Him day and night. And He says, they will neither hunger nor thirst. Verse 16. And the Lamb is going to be the shepherd, verse 17, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So the result of the preaching of the 144,000 Jews is that many, many, many people all over the world are going to be saved. They will be martyred. And they're coming up before the throne of God and they're worshipping God. This will happen. Seven seals, seven judgments are happening on the earth. 
catastrophic things are happening. 144,000 Jews are preaching. Souls are being saved. They are being killed for their faith in Jesus. They are appearing in the throne room of God, worshipping God. Revelation 8. So while all of this is going on, the last seal represents a time of silence, quietness in heaven. And then the next set of judgments are going to be poured out. These are seven trumpets. But before the seven trumpets, the, the judgment of the seven trumpets can happen, we see something interesting. Revelation chapter 8. Verses three to three to five. What happens? Revelation eight three to five. There's a golden censer. There's an angel that uh, uh, throws a golden censer, and he fills it with fire on the altar from the altar, and he throws it to the earth. But this golden incense. Is representing something. It's representing the prayers of the saints. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints was for ascending before the throne of God. So, what is happening? While the seal judgments are going on, the 144,000 Jews are preaching, people are getting saved, they're being martyred. There is also prayer rising up before the throne. So we can say that during the tribulation, there's going to be a global prayer movement. People are going to pray like never before. Because it says there is so much incense, the prayers of the saints coming up before the throne of God. And this censer is being thrown to the earth. Meaning it's like saying, you know, I'm going to add fuel to the fire. I'm going to make this stronger. And remember that that sense of representing prayer, prayer is being thrown to the earth. There's God by His power is going to cause a massive prayer movement happening on the earth. Revelation eight three to five, the prayers rising up before the throne of God during the tribulation. People are going to be praying. Then there are the next set of judgments, the seven trumpets. So what do we see in verse 7, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7? One third of the vegetation is destroyed. Then uh, a third, Revelation 8 and verse 8, this third of the waters are destroyed. They become like blood. 8, verse 10, chapter 8, verse 10. Uh, the waters, the rivers and waters destroy, become bitter, water problem. Chapter 8, verse 12, the sun, the moon, the stars are darkened. So once again it's happening. It happened in chapter 6, we saw, happening again in chapter 8, verse 12. And remember Joel prophesied, Joel chapter 2, in the last days, as God is pouring out His Spirit, He said the sun will be darkened and the moon will be turned into blood red before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Joel prophesied. Joel 2, 28 to 31. And that's seeing that's happening here. Revelation 8, 12. The sun is darkened and, 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 and so on. So imagine when the sun is darkened, the earth is going to be, the, it's going to be catastrophic. The weather conditions. Right? Then chapter 9, verse 1. On the fifth trumpet, there are demonic powers uh, that are released on the earth, and uh, they are destroying people to the point, uh, except you know, they won't touch the people of the seal of God on the foreheads. And and they're destroying people for a period of five months, Revelation 9, 5, to the point where men will seek death and they will desire to die. 
So there's some sort of a demonic power. Demons are released on the earth, and they're going to trouble people in such a way that for five months that people will want to die. Right? So demonic powers are released on the earth. So it's going to be very, very terrible. People will want to die. They want to die because of all the suffering that they're experiencing. Sixth angel, this is Revelation 9.13, and uh, it says, Release the angels that are from the great river Euphrates, and one-third of, of mankind are killed. And he sees horsemen, Revelation 9.16, 200 million, and verse 17, these horses have a breastplate of fiery red, hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, and what are they causing? Fire, smoke, and brimstone. And verse 18, Revelation 9, 18. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone. So, this is where we see an army of 200 million. Now, when he says horsemen, doesn't mean they're going to be riding on horses. It just, it's, you know, in, in, in John's understanding, they, they are military, they are soldiers, the military people. And uh, verse 17, Revelation 9 17 is talking about fire, smoke, and brimstone, sulfur yellow, uh, red, and blue. So, it you know, remember John is saying things which are way ahead of his time. He may not understand, you know, uh, nuclear weapons, and he may not understand. He would not have definitely understood nuclear weapons and you know weapons of mass destruction and uh, missiles and those kinds of things. He would tanks and so on. But he's seeing this destruction, which today we can say. These kinds of things, fire, smoke, and brimstone, by which one third of people are killed, could definitely happen. Right? With the kind of weapons and uh, warheads that are there today, these kinds of things can happen. Now, this army of 200 million is interesting because. There's only one country that could possibly have such a big army. And again, the passage doesn't say China. It doesn't indicate to us. But it's quite possible this is pointing to such kind of an army. right? And, and uh, we will see later on. And uh, we also read about this in Daniel chapter 11. That when the Antichrist is operating, he will be terrified by news that comes from the east and the north. And we will study Daniel uh, next year. He'll be terrified by news from the east and the north. And he's the Antichrist operating within Israel. So from the east, which most likely, you know, we could say the armies from the east, China and others, the north from Russia. So, um, it is not stated in scripture clearly. Now, Russia we can understand because of the names of the tribes that are given in Ezekiel 38. We will look at it, you know. But here in Revelation 9 17, it doesn't tell us who these 200 million are. But we can speculate, you know, we can guess. Maybe the only country that could have such a big army is China, and so maybe it's them moving here. Maybe, right? And when we come later on, Revelation 16, it, it'll tell us about the river Euphrates drying up and the army is moving in from that side. Okay, so um, again, we are guessing, 
the armies from the east uh, could be China and its allies moving in. Okay. The one more thing I want to point out here in Revelation 9 is verses 20 and 21 that while all this is happening, it says the rest of mankind did not repent. Look at that, Revelation 9, 20 and 21. They did not repent. And they continued worshipping demons. They continued worshipping idols, verse 21. They continued in their murderous and sorceries and immorality. So you can think about the hardness of people's heart, that while all these things are happening on the earth, yes, there are there are a certain number of people who are turning to Christ and dying for Christ and they're coming up into heaven. But Revelation 9, 20, 21 is also telling us that there will be numbers of people who don't repent. They will continue in their evil ways while all this is happening. You know, uh, they can read the scriptures and, hey, say, look, these, these are things the scripture is speaking about but they will not repent. This brings us to Revelation chapter 10, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a parenthetical chapter. In this chapter, John is having an experience where he sees a mighty angel coming to him with a book that's open and uh, and uh, this angel is a very big, huge, powerful angel. And, uh, and this angel, uh, Revelation 10, um, uh, when the, uh, this angel uh, comes to John and he says, um, take this little book and uh, eat it, you know, so John, takes this book and eats it. Now, of course, remember, it's a vision. It's not like he's physically eating it, but in the vision, he is seeing this big angel come to him and say, John, eat this book. And John eats this book. So he's seeing this vision. And John is in the spirit, he's in heaven, and then he's seeing this happen. And uh, he, as he eats this book, he feels that initially it's very sweet, then it becomes bitter. And then the angel says, okay, you're eating this book, it means you have to prophesy some more. That means there is some more prophetic revelation coming to you about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings, Revelation 10 and verse 11. Right? So it's this, in the vision is seeing this, and that, that experience is basically telling John, John, you know, you're going to get more revelation. You're going to get more prof prophetic revelation about things that are going to happen. It's okay. Now, Revelation chapter 11 marks the midpoint of the tribulation. Midpoint meaning Revelation 6 to Revelation, end of Revelation 10 is the first three and a half years. Revelation 11 to Revelation 19, end of 19, early part of 20, is the second three and a half years. How do we know it? In Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, Revelation 11, 1 and 2, John C. He says, you know, he sees the angels saying, hey, measure the temple of God. Uh, this is, but leave out the outer coat and all of it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. Revelation 11, verse 2, they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. So that's why we say Revelation 11 is the middle of the tribulation. Now the angel is saying, for the next 42 months, the Gentiles are going to trample Jerusalem underfoot. So, 42 months means that seven years we spoke about of Daniel's 70th year is this period of the tribulation. 
and Revelation 11 is the middle of that for the next 42 months. So everything happening from Revelation 11 onwards is the next 42 months, the next three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. What will happen? In Revelation 11, we find, we read about the two witnesses. Uh, Revelation 11, 3, 11, verse 3. God says, you know, I'm going to send these two witnesses. Now, and they are going to be ministering for 1,260 days. That's uh, uh, three and a half years, almost three and a half years. They're going to be ministering here on 1,260 days. So Revelation 11 is giving us an idea of what these two witnesses are going to do for the second half, or during the second half of the tribulation. It tells us that um, they're going to do mighty signs and wonders. They're going to have power to shut up heaven, no rain, and they'll call fire from the from the mm, from heaven, and uh, uh, they will. Uh, but but what will happen is Revelation eleven verse eight, the seven and eight, that uh, the beast, which is the Antichrist, he's going to make war against them. I will read more about the beast in Revelation 13, right? So the name, the beast, is suddenly introduced for us here in Revelation 11, verse 7. The beast that ascends from the bottomless pit. Now, this beast, we will see, is the Antichrist. Uh, it doesn't mean he's going to come from the bottom. It means that he is a man who is empowered by hell. He's empowered by the powers of darkness, by hell. He's going to kill them. Verse 8, their dead bodies will lie in the street, the great city, um, Jerusalem. Now, spiritually, it's called Sodom and Egypt because spiritually, Jerusalem has departed from God. That's why it says, you know, it's spiritually it's called Sodom in Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Revelation 11, verse 8. So in that city of Jerusalem, which spiritually has departed from God, these two people will be there. And notice verse 9, it says, people from all over the world will see their dead bodies three and a half days. Think about that. People from all over the world are going to see their dead bodies for three and a half days. Now, only in our day and time could something like this happen. Today, everyone can see what's happening in different parts of the world. In life, you know, you can, on your phone, you can, you know, connect whatever live stream is, hap is happening. And in real time, on your phone, you can see what, what is happening in a different part of the world. About 30 years ago, it was not, you know, not possible. You know, yeah, you would read in the newspaper, but that would happen later on. Or you might see a video on, on television. But here, Re Revelation 9, 11 verse 9, you're seeing it in real time. And then it says in verse 11, after three and a half days, life will come into them. They will stand on their feet and they will be taken up into heaven. Revelation 11 verse 12. And people will see it in great fear will come on them. So these two prophets, two witnesses, are serving God in this second half of the tribulation for three and a half years or 1,260 days. Towards the end of that period, they're going to be killed. Their bodies will be seen all over the world. They'll be lying there in Jerusalem for three and a half days. And while people are watching, 
they will rise up and they will be taken to heaven. So again, it's a powerful sign from God that He is doing something. Now, of course, the question is, who would these two people be? Who are these two witnesses? And um, there are different opinions. Uh, now, one is we know one person would be Elijah, because in Malachi chapter 4, God says, I will send Elijah the prophets to you uh, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So God said, I will send Elijah the prophet. Now, when the Lord Jesus was here on his earthly ministry, he said, you know, in Matthew 17, he referring to John the Baptist, he said, Elijah has come. But Jesus also said, Elijah will come, Matthew 17. So that means he says, okay, here's John the Baptist. He's come in the spirit and power of Elijah, but the, the Elijah will also come. Jesus also said that. So we could, you know, with, with a lot of confidence, say that one of these two uh, witnesses would be Elijah. Why would it be Elijah? Because he didn't die physically. He was caught and taken up into heaven. So if we go by that premise, if we go by that reasoning, then we would say, well, the other person like that was Enoch. He was caught up into heaven. He didn't die. So um, most likely the other, wit other witness would be Enoch. Um, and both these men would be sent back to the earth. They will bear witness. And then they will be killed, they will die, and they will be taken up into heaven. Now, some people say that it could be Moses, because on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Moses and Elijah appeared along with Jesus. So that's their reasoning as to why the, sec the second, the other witness could be Moses. Uh, you know, my my preference would be. Uh, my thought would be Elijah and Enoch for the same reason that uh, both these men were didn't die. They were taken up into heaven. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. But, you know, we know Elijah was specifically stated. God said, I will send Elijah. The other one we don't know. We could, you know, do our best guess based on uh, what we see in Scripture. But we don't have to fight about it. The most important thing is, you know, there will be these two witnesses who will be serving God in the second half of the tribulation. They will do mighty things, and the, the details that are given here will be fulfilled. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. Any questions so far? We haven't finished chapter 11. There's some more. Uh, we'll pick up in the second part of chapter 11 next week. But uh, is everyone following me? You all with me so far? Any questions? Okay, I'm assuming things are clear. Uh, uh, okay, if there's any doubt or anything that comes to your mind later on, you know, just feel free to ask. And this is just an overview of, of the chapter by chapter. We're not reading every verse. Next year we will do it. Um, but it gives us a good idea of these are the things that are going to happen during the tribulation uh, as the Lord revealed it to John. Okay, so let's um, pray and close for today, and we will continue this next week, and we'll see how far we go next week, and we'll pick up in uh, middle of Revelation uh, and finish that. Okay, could somebody pray with us, and uh, then we will dismiss the class. Anybody could pray, please. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time of learning. We pray and ask, O oh God, that we would continue to wait upon your coming and prepare ourselves, Lord Jesus. And we also pray that we would be able to uh, read and meditate upon the uh, book of Revelation and Daniel and um, get uh, more insights from it and to understand ourselves what you are trying to tell us, Lord Jesus, that you would open the eyes of our understanding 
that we would grow with you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for uh, this class. We thank you for all our uh, classmates. We declare your grace and protection upon each one of us, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, let's take a break and then you can head off to your next class. God bless. Thank you. Bye now. See you next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. See you soon.